I want connection, and yet I'm afraid of the spark. What if I get burned? What if I get hurt? What if it sets me on fire and I become ash? And, and, and. What if the spark ignites me? What if it awakens something asleep in me? What if it does set me on fire and keeps me warm? What if it burns away an old me that no longer serves me? What if it connects me back to myself and in a way that even if burned, hurt, set on fire, turned to ash, I'd rise renewed, alive, awake, warm, and ready to bravely seek out another spark. This is a taste of the poetry work today's guest, Lana Dingwall, brings to the world. Welcome to Side by Side, a podcast where I, Robert Kwong, take you inside conversations with artists, creatives, healers, and warriors taking the charge on their transformational story. You can find a collection of Lana's poetry through the link in their social media bios as an offering to welcome any donations to support their upcoming top surgery. I'm excited to spotlight the multifaceted world of Lana. And please, connect with him online and say hello. And today's special guest is my friend Lana Dingwall, who is a finance and business coach. Um, Amongst other things, they are also a poet, they're a co-creator of Astrid Park, in Canada, where you can reserve camper motels for some leisure and nature. <laughs> they are the creator of the podcast, Changing the Story, filled with insights and learnings for your entrepreneurship and your personal growth, uh, especially for women. I think I'm missing like three other things, probably. They are a Web3 enthusiast. Is there <laughs> anything else that you want to acknowledge? <laughs> a Web3 enthusiast. I think you named most of them. I'm just, I'm, a, I'm an adventurer and an explorer and someone who likes to create and entrepreneurship tends to be my vessel, which is why there's lots of things in there. Um, and to clarify, I'm a, like, I help the finance piece, like don't come to me for um, like, investment info. I'm more like good at helping people think of creative ways to make money, um, but not through yes. necessarily like traditional means. Yeah. And very entrepreneurial in mm -hmm. your approach or being, being willing to work with people who kind of are outside of the box a little bit. Thank you. Yes. Um, I know you a little bit. So I know you have a natural you kind of see a natural way that creativity and creative expression and business and work can coexist. And in fact, you sort of like have them really build off of each other, both in your the way that you've set up the way you work and your business, but also you're very unfiltered and unapologetic about who you are, your identity. They don't have to be separate in the way you approach like professional work versus a personal relationship, for example. If you were to backtrack, why do you think or where does that come from? Kind of seeing the natural way that creativity and business and work can kind of like come together. That's a good question. Uh, I, I part of me feels like I am naturally wired that way. I'm a nanogram seven. So I'm all about like possibility and potential. And I don't really believe in rules too much. Like I'm the type of person where I'm like, rules are meant to be broken. That's what they're there for. So those things all help. Um, but then I genuinely think a large part of my willingness to do things my way um, and, and encourage others to do things their way knowing that those two ways might not look anything alike and both are okay. I genuinely feel like actually comes from being queer um, because like queerness at its root is, is all about like, as you would say, coloring outside of the lines, being who you are, embracing who you are. And so much of queerness is about self-discovery despite other people trying to tell you who it is that you're supposed to be and how it is that you're supposed to operate and learning very quickly that those like models or roles for happiness won't work for you they don't work for lots of people but it definitely being queer they won't um I'm also non-binary so 
again, even if in the space of gender, I feel that way. So I, I really believe that a lot of those things, those aspects of who I am have given me permission to do life the way I want. And that includes entrepreneurship and business because work is such a huge component of our lived experiences. And I believe people should do work that really excites them and makes them come alive and feels more like an expression or an extension of their being than it necessarily feels like work. Um, And so for all of those reasons, I think it kind of comes together in, in how I build businesses and in how those businesses intersect with my life. And then in how I encourage others to intersect and build businesses as well. Yeah, I love being intersectional with work and the way that I view things. And I know you do as well. Um, if you had listened, especially early on in your career or in your work life, like this is who you're supposed to be. This is how this is the best way to do work. And this is the best way to be a business person. And this is the best way to be a human being. I mean, if you had listened to everything that was said to you early on, how different would your life be? I'd be straight, uh, <laughs> which would be so boring for me. For me, it would be boring, you know, mm-hmm. for, for people who are heterosexual, it's great for them. Um, I, I, but from like a business context and like a, a you know, non-joking context, um, I think I would feel a lot of like rigidity and, an, and to be honest, when I first started my business, there was a lot of performance uh, again, a lot of parallels between like queerness and gender and, and, and truthfully, everyone feels that they per- are performative in various roles in their lives, um, regardless of their sexuality or their gender identity. And um, so when I first started my business, I definitely felt like I had to perform. I had to be this entrepreneur, what a business person looked like. I was also combating being younger, like at that time, I'm 33 now, but I was about like 27, 28 when I was venturing in to, to coaching. And so I also felt this need to kind of compensate for what I felt like was a young looking appearance. And then obviously presenting as female added like another layer of, of really feeling like I had to present myself in a certain way. Uh, and I did that for a bit and it, it, it did never feel good, but at the time it felt like the only way. Um, And as time went on, I really started to find other people I admired who seemed to be kind of, you know, marching to the sound of their own drum or the beat of their own drum. Uh, And then there was also this thing that kept coming up for me around sustainability. How can performing be sustainable? How can pretending to be someone I'm not really be sustainable? How can like this persona I'm putting on be sustainable? And the answer was it wasn't. And ultimately the key to having a really successful business or businesses is about sustainability. Um, It's not necessarily about doing everything the same way forever, but it's about having the energy to continuously show up and tinker and, and pivot when you need to pivot and change course when you have to, and keep building and ask for help and all those beautiful messy parts about uh, building a business that come up. So the sustainability piece was, was big. Um, and for me, the, the conformity looked everything from like dressing really feminine, like wearing dresses. Imagine, okay, Robert, you know me, like imagine me wearing a dress, giving a talk, you know, it's funny to think about now, but I definitely did it because in my mind it was like, okay, like I have to, I have to present a certain way. Um, and at the time too, I, I wasn't, uh, like out as non-binary. Um, but, and then there were just other things like this feeling of having to be serious, Mm -hmm. this feeling of having to be what I felt like a coach was supposed to be versus taking the time to really figure out what is my flavor of coaching? What is my flavor of entrepreneurship, which is much more how I am today. Yeah. Well, thank you for kind of owning the trans, like the evolution that inevitably has to happen in business or just in life. And I find it so funny that people find it unorthodox for people's identity to change over time, even though if we were to take it outside of like a gender expression context, that's what life is for everyone. You know, I'm curious, what was it like 
you know, it's very different to be a business owner and to be front facing and have to put yourself out there versus being, for example, an employee that doesn't necessarily have to be exposed in that way. What was your experience like having your identity evolve as you are also a public facing business owner who has to represent themselves? You know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean. Um, I, again, I'm an optimist, so this is just my perspective, and I think other people um, would would could potentially have a different perspective. Um, for me, there's there's a deep sense of responsibility in being a public facing figure, like a person who people look to for guidance, and as a person who positions themselves online as someone to go to for advice, uh, as a coach. And just a person in general, I feel like there is deep, deep sense of responsibility in that. Um, but then on the other side of it, I, I do feel actually having full autonomy and control over what I do and how I do it, I feel has given me more freedom in being able to embrace who I am. I, I can imagine it would be potentially more difficult to work within an environment where I would have felt like I didn't have as much control and maybe had to actually perform longer. For me, a lot of being able to be like genuinely myself in all of the various components that make up me, um, even just from everything from like, you know, putting in humor and yeah, mixing in poetry with uh, talking about web three and crypto and NFTs to like giving a motivational talk like they they are all different facets of me and therefore they all belong. Um, but, but I run my own business. So I just had to have that conversation with myself around, okay, we're going to do this. Um, knowing that again, taking into the, this piece of responsibility around having a platform. Um, I knew that there wasn't anything that I was doing that was going to like contradict something I had done or said before. It was more in giving myself permission to be me. I inevitably gave others more permission to be themselves as well. And so it was this beautiful like dual liberation. Um, so the actual like process of embracing myself more in a public figure sense, although scary, um, also very, very rewarding. And potentially, again, this is where some people might disagree. My experience was I, and again, I, you know, I barely worked, um, as like, I worked in nonprofit for six years, which even then, like it's nonprofit. So, um, it's a different experience. I'm not sure what it would be like to work in the corporate world. And I know that there's a lot of performance, uh, in like performative everyone has a persona work persona like that's the joke you know your partner is on their work meeting and you're like who is that person um so I feel I feel happy in being like there's no version of that for me it, it is very much people routinely tell me when they meet me in real life that they're like wow you are exactly who I thought you were going to be and that's very nice and refreshing and part of that is because I do actually try to honor all the facets of who I am online um, in, in various ways. Well, you mentioned, you know, you starting having been in the coaching world for a number of years now, and you've been able to observe some of its like evolution over the years, particularly compared to some people who are a little bit newer to, uh, to taking an interest in coaching and life coaching. Um, this might be a low, like a, heavy burden to place on you, but just for fun, what are some things that you feel like have changed about working, about coaching, about uh, working with coaches, or just like the atmosphere, particularly, let's say, in the past few years, right, um, the mm -hmm. past year or two? I'm just curious if you have any overall observations. I definitely do. And I want to start by saying that I fundamentally believe in coaching the same way that I like fundamentally believe in therapy and all forms of, of healing and good coaches can do incredible things for you. Uh, and with that said, I do feel that currently there's a lot of people out there and there, this has always been true. So this is not like a new thing. I just feel like the pandemic really like intensified this because a lot of people who get into coaching and, and we both know this because this also applies to us. 
Um, a lot of people get into coaching because they themselves have some type of um, epiphany or shift or change or realization and really want to be in service of of other people, which is a very beautiful and noble thing to want to do. Um, I have found though, that there is a lot of coaches out there. Um, and again, fundamentally, I believe in coaching and finding the right coaches. And I think you should work with multiple over the course of your life, not all at once. Cause that's way too much work. <laughs> um, working with multiple coaches. Like I've had coaches that have completely changed the course of my life in so many beautiful ways. Um, but there can be coaches out there that they essentially like the saying goes, you can only take a client as far as you've taken yourself. That's like the variation of the saying. And what that essentially means is, you know, as, as a coach, we can't hold space for or work with people. Um, if we ourselves haven't like really gone into the depths of who we are and, and examined a lot of the things that maybe we don't want to, that are preventing us from doing the things that we would hire a coach to, to do. Uh, and so I feel like there's some coaches in the industry where it's sort of like they skipped over that step. So they, they, it's like the bypassing of, I don't, I'm not going to do my own work. And instead I'm going to like work, fix you, which is like a classic martyr syndrome, which hand up, like totally have suffered from myself, the hero complex guilty of it. Yeah. I think like all coaches have it. That's why, and therapists have it. That's why we do what we do. Um, and so I think it's just being mindful. If you are a coach, being mindful of your own hero complex, your own like martyr martyrism, um, and how that could be affecting your coaching or how you could be trying to overcompensate for an insecurity that you have via your coaching. Um, and just like holding awareness around that and, and working through it. Um, cause it's not to say that like, like, you know, we're all complicated, messy people. So it's not to say that you have to be like perfect or anything. It's just, it's just more, I believe that coaching is really about helping people do like deep inner work. Um, and so sometimes that can't be like a cookie cutter here. Let's go through like these three exercises. Um, but then at the same time, I feel as though the coaching space has, again, it's almost like a oxymoron or it's like a conflict, but I also feel like in so many ways, the coaching industry has like blown up in beautiful, amazing ways where I see coaches who are blending like their therapists and then they become a coach and then they blend therapy and coaching. I've worked with a lot of those as like, as I'm the client and I've hired coaches that are like therapists or psychologists by trade and then love coaching because coaching allows for more, um, choose your own adventure as I, I kind of call it um, the same thing in the, in the healing space, you see a lot of like um, spiritual practitioners that will take on coaching um, and it can be like this really beautiful, amazing thing. Cause coaching, at least the way that I ascribe to it, I'm Canadian. So we have um, like the coaching federation and things like that are, are huge everywhere, but I feel like there's a little less, and maybe this is just my own social bubble too, but I feel like there is less um, putting on the pedestal of certain kinds of coaching programs. And there's a little bit more um, get like, do your due diligence, get certified, get trained, work with coaches, but ultimately like, like therapy um, coaching is really about like, everyone has their own personal style and their own personal, like focus of coaching. And you just get really good at that. Um but I'm not sure if that answers your question, um, but that those are some of my, my reflections. Yeah. So much has changed in many ways because it's the, the word coaching is just circulating culture in a, in a way that's a little bit differently. And the fact that I think, you know, coaching and therapeutic work um, and one-on-one -on -one services like that um, has the option to be done virtually. Although I will say it is quite different doing it in person and doing it virtually. But, yeah. you know, there are so many things that have changed and evolved for for coaches um, that it was just interesting to hear your reflection. And, you know, when we talk about blending and being able to take like our past experiences, whether it's like you in nonprofit, I've worked in nonprofit as well. Like there are certain things that we take along side our life experiences that are so useful. Right. Um, one thing that I, you and I have in common is that we also kind of see 
um, spirituality and spiritual yes. practice as being not a like they're not natural opponents to business to work to uh getting things done to seeing tangible results and things like that right and you and i have had so many conversations around this but um could you dive into a little bit of where your interest in spirituality come comes from mm -hmm. I don't know if there's like an original source. Uh, I would definitely say my grandma, who I refer to as Mana, um, she had a big influence on me when I was younger and was very open to all things spiritual, very adamant around, um, you know, not having us necessarily be, and my parents aren't religious, so not having us grow up within a certain like sect of religion and instead be free to learn about all of them. And she was really well versed in many of the world religions and just other forms of spirituality. Like she taught me all about like Wiccan practices and their mythologies and taught me a lot about um, just the general kind of, I guess you would call it new age spiritual, uh, spiritual spirituality in North America, um, which is kind of like a mismatch of a bunch of different stuff. So I grew up with her as like one of my biggest idols. Like I really, really admired my mana growing up uh, and still do today. She's just has passed, but she's still, um, you know, with me as we've, as we have discussed with, with our, our grandma lineages. Yeah. Our teams. <laughs> uh, exactly. Our teams. So I would definitely say that she helped, like she helped plant a seed that made me curious. Um, I also actually studied religion in my undergrad, I studied religion and gender studies. Um, so two things that had nothing to do with business, but at the same time seemed to just really fit into who I am and what I do today. Uh, and so that also was a component of it. Um, and I just feel like for me, I've always just believed in reincarnation. Like it, there was never a real maybe if I didn't name it, it's not something that I ever necessarily like doubted. Like I was like, yeah, reincarnation seems to make sense. Like whether it be like the Buddhist form of reincarnation, whether it be like any form of reincarnation. Um, and so I think that belief in reincarnation did push me more into the realm of spirituality and just like that I'm a naturally curious person that likes to explore and so this idea of, okay, well, if we live multiple lives, then like, who were we in these lives before us? What does it mean? Like, what is the journey that we are on? Like, does karma exist? Do soulmates exist? Like, how are, like, what is a, is a, you know, a past trauma bond, as they say, what, um, what am I carrying from my past life? Like, you know, I'm a big fan of Maggie Rogers, as you know, um, and she wrote a whole album, you know, um, inspired by like past lives and like her album Wait, was called I didn't know this actually yeah yeah so her last album not like the one she just released but she, the her original al debut album is based um, on like her called heard it in a past life and um there's certain songs like not the whole album but there's certain songs that are like very much about that and one mm. of the things she talks about is just like, what if you've, what if I've been preparing for this for lifetimes? And this is just like the lifetime that I get it right. Um, and she was expressing how like a song, songs sometimes just like fall out of her as if she's written them before and it's just remembering them. And so there's those types of like things that I find so fascinating and they're like little threads that I pull at and, you know, there's no end to the pulling. There's just more questions that come up from it. Um, so I, I, for those types of things or those types of reasons, that's why I find I'm quite fascinated with spirituality as a concept. Um, I don't practice a particular re religion, um, but I also just find it super fascinating that, you know, for all the things that make us different, history shows us that religion and spirituality are huge components of human culture and societal organization. Um, and I think it's really interesting that brains actually have a component that is designed for us to conceptualize something as vast and hard to conceptualize as God and religion. Um, 
And I have friends who are so literal, like you can't tell them to imagine something like you can't be like, imagine this, like they, their brains don't work in that way, but you ask them, well, do you believe in God? And they're like, well, of course. Um, and it's just this interesting thing where like, we literally have a separate component in our brain that is designed to be able to be- hold a belief for something that we cannot prove exists um, nor can fully understand or grasp. And I think that that's kind of cool. So that's where your poet side comes from. I see <laughs> like it just, you just gave a little mini sermon to us. And for some reason, my, the entire time I was like, oh my God, this is your poet side. And I, I, I would assume that resonates with you, but there's something about the way that you talk about meaning and life and existence and what does it all mean that seems to be like the same like the same like voice as when you're doing poetry yes my poetry definitely has like the flavor of like big existential (laughs) ponderings um and I think that exploring something as like vast uh as the human existence and potentially reincarnation and just like the universe, like all of these really big things. Poetry is just, I feel like this perfect little container to express something that might take me like, you know, five chapters to write if I'm just using like normal language, but somehow can summarize into a like three paragraph poem. (laughs) Yep, that's been my experience with poetry. And although I, I don't feel as adept at it as you as you are uh, with it clearly, but it's something I've always admired. Do you have a favorite like memory of that is related to creating art or creating poetry? I I always ha- I have like a very poor memory. Um, I think that would. <laughs> I think what I would say though, is it's just like the general act of writing poetry. I really enjoy because there is genuinely something that just feels like it falls out of me. Um, And I was listening to something that I think it was, uh, oh my God, what's his name? The guy who wrote the four hour work week. He has a podcast tip top note. Tim Ferriss. Tim Ferriss. Yeah. I was like, what's his name? Tim Ferriss. He was interviewing um, Margaret Atwood and she, you know, obviously is a writer, but also a poet. And she was talking about how like poetry, you can just like write on the go and poetry, like sometimes just like it, it, like you can just be like doing something and then boom, you have like a poem or the workings of a poem. You just have to write it down. Um, So I think like when it comes to like my favorite memory, I guess you would say of, of creating it's it's just like that constant knowing that a poem could just like fall out of me as they say, or, or some type of pondering or idea. Cause I also write things that maybe are more like a short form essay, but there are not things that I am sitting down to write. It's not something where I'm like, okay, like, you know, crack your knuckles, like let's write a poem. It's more like, um, I can feel it coming on and I'm like, okay, I just need to create some space and then something comes out or it can be, I just get a flash and I have to like write it out. Um, and so that's why I'm sure you do too. I have a bunch of uh, like unfinished poems too, because it's like, I waited too long or only half of it got out, but I know that at some point, the second half of it will come. I just need to be mm-hmm. patient. And I think that that's like a fun, it's, it's, it's a memory, but it's like a present and continuing unfolding memory where it's just like that funness of knowing that the poems that I've written that I love the most that others really enjoy as well or any like thing I've written that people love or things that I've spoken that people really love people are like wow that was so powerful and I'll be like I can't even remember what I wrote because I just feel like I get I get taken over you know and it's like someone else is doing the writing I'm just channeling um and so that part's like the fun part of creating and that's kind of fun because it always comes up I always am like oh let's try to sustain that part a little bit more you know and in fact that's sort of what happened when we co-created an event together it was like music and poetry like artistic expression related but 
it kind of fell out of just us exploring and experimenting on our own time, you know? Exactly. And there's then the act of like, people are like, wow, that was so powerful. And both of us are like, I kind of blacked out, but I think I'm going to watch the recording and I'm sure it's good. <laughs> You're like, don't ask me what I said, but thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Well, even you, like you get this look where you come, you know, cause I'm watching you. Um, you get this like look sometimes where it's like you you look like you're coming in and out a, a little bit because mm -hmm. when i have to like play the piano it's like i have to focus in a different way than truthfully i it it's like i have to focus a different way than sometimes doing like work admin related things you know and so when i am talking to someone and then like going in to like do some creative work like music or something i do have to like shift uh, gears a little bit and in fact, I would say a little bit of like meditative and spiritual practice has helped me with that, even with like visualization to help me go from one place to another and switch hats. It's a, you know, I'm able to be a little more mindful thanks to kind of taking in all these other things that I'm also interested in. And I'm sure that's the same for you. Yeah. Well, it's our multifaceted nature, right? That's where we are. It's not that we are so many different people because we're just one person. It's that there's so many different, again, like a kaleidoscope. There's so many different like facets and depending on the situation, it might look different or feel different. I know that you've reflected to me too, that when I'm doing like the poetry in the meditation space or doing a meditation, you've commented and other people have commented that my voice changes. I, I'm obviously doing it, like my voice changes, but it's not necessarily like this very conscious, okay, like I'm going to talk a little bit softer. Um, Cause I have a very, like I talk very loudly and I talk really fast and I get really excited. My friends constantly have to tell me that I'm being too loud. Uh, and so that's not like the same version that is like reading something that I've written for the sake of like a poem or a mindfulness activity, but it is the same person. But there is just like, again, we all have it where it's almost like you just shift a gear. You just shift a gear consciously, spiritually, whatever. You shift a gear and then you do the work and then you shift out of that gear and you go back into like your, no your normal gear. And it's not an active. And I think that going back to your previous question too, around like um, feeling like you have to be someone or, or do things a certain way in your business or in your life, there, that shifting gears within the, the realm of who you are is not the same thing as like putting on a persona that isn't you, that you think you have to be shifting your gears within who you are is like your makeup and how it is that you're supposed to like thrive and interact in this world. Um, and we all have like those various gears for different reasons, but so many of us really only spend time like living our life in one or two of them because we either don't allow ourselves to explore the other gears, we haven't accessed them yet. I was thinking it's important to say, if, if you used to have something that you no longer have that you like wish you did, like a skill or a way of being, you haven't lost it. You've just lost access to it for some particular reason. There's a block. Um, so it's like, you know, the youthful, like how people are always like, oh, I wish I could just be as fun and easygoing as I was when I was younger. I wish I could just be more playful as when I was with a kid, when I was a kid. And you're like, well, you didn't lose that. Like it's not gone. You just lost access to it. You, you it's blocked and you need to unblock it again. And there's a gear in you that will get you there that you can like do things in that is really amazing and fun. And then when you need to shift out of it, you can. Absolutely. That's kind of what happens when we connect is like being less apologetic about all the parts of who we are and that they are they can be distinct we feel like they can serve different purposes you know and that it is honoring and respecting other people's needs and boundaries and intentions by showing up very intentionally in a particular way and that's sort of how i think about the creative process these days um rather than just sort of a random act you know you're kind of like fingers crossed as something that we begin to cultivate within ourselves and also through our daily practices for other people who are interested in um, working with a coach or diving into like, let's say even creative expression, what are some ways that you recommend that they can get started? That's a good question. I would recommend um, you wanna find someone who you resonate with um, and you resonate with them 
because again, we're all like mirrors. They resonate with you because there's just something about them that you feel can help or support or unlock something in you. And I try really hard to encourage people to like avoid like the marketing terms. So it's like, if you're looking, you know, if you're an entrepreneur and you need help with building your business, as an example, like marketing is designed to speak to exactly what it is that you cognitively feel and know that you need. Um, And sometimes we can go wrong in choosing a coach for ourselves because we're just focusing on the coach's marketing language, like their sales page or their website or their Instagram copy. And so my recommendation is just, you know, if you can insert, like read posts that they've written that are not tactic or skill-based, if they have a podcast, listen to it. If they do videos or stories, anything that can really show you a glimpse of just who they are, like their essence, I would recommend looking at those things as well. Um, because again, marketing language is designed to speak exactly to our like desires or insecurities. And sometimes we can choose their own coaches simply because they have really, really great marketing copy. But if we had just done like a vibe check, we might've quickly realized, oh, this person isn't necessarily for me, or I don't know if I'll vibe with them. Because again, you want to be working with someone that you feel like can see you, can understand you, can support you, especially if you want to be multifaceted, if you want to embrace more aspects of who you are, you definitely want to work with someone that that's what they're about. Um, And yeah, I know for me, like so many of my like best and most favorite clients are very often people who have seen me speak in real life have come to like a workshop or retreat that I've run or have listened to my podcast. Um, And the reason they're my best and my favorite is because they've spent a lot of time getting to know me outside of working with me. And then that made it so that when they finally decided to work with me, they were like full in and were really excited and essentially already knew how to get the best of me because they had, it's not that they'd done their due diligence, but that they spent time learning about how I coach and how I do things just through the content that I was putting out there versus just the marketing copy. Now the marketing copy also lined up with what they wanted. So that worked too, but they didn't pick me based on just um, my marketing copy. And truthfully, some of my most unaligned clients only looked at my website um, and within working with each other was like, oh, like we are not that we're different, but I want people to do things their own way. And sometimes people don't want to do things their own way. Sometimes people just want to be told what they should do um, and be given like that, that checkbox of guaranteed, if you do these things, you will be successful versus spending time figuring out who you are and how and what success looks like for you. Um, So those would be my recommendations, just like if you can, or just like have a call with them, things like that as well to, and ask them questions. Um, so just so you can make sure that's the right like alignment people wise. Absolutely. So where can people find you on the web? Uh, I would recommend Instagram or Twitter. So on Instagram, it's at Lana Dingwall. Surprise, surprise is not a common name. So it's, it'll be, I'll be easy to find. Uh, Robert also mentioned I have a podcast, Changing the Story. But again, if you look up Lana Dingwall, you'll find me. Um, Twitter, it's at Lance Dings. But if you also just type in Lana Dingwall, I will come up. Those are probably my two best spots. Um, you can always check out my website as well. Uh, if you're interested in the off-grid camper motel that I run, it's Astrid Park. Um, and just in general, like when in doubt or if you want to get to know more about me or talk to me in any way, yeah, just sending me an Instagram message or an email is best. Yay. So please say hi to Lana. And uh, thank you so much for your time and your insights today. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in. And if you'd like to share your creative process, please email robert at robertquangcoaching.com. I'd love to hear from you. If you'd like to stay connected, you can find me at robertquangcoaching.com and on Instagram at robertquangcoaching.